Dear God, it is with gratitude that we come before you today. Um, at least some of us. Others of us are, are just, um, we've had a rough week. And we're dealing with a lot. Some are watching from home, not able to be here in person. Uh, but thankful to have the live stream to be able to, to participate in this way. However we come to you today, Father, we are grateful that you're our God, and we're grateful that you are good. We're grateful that by faith through Jesus, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and someday we will see you face to face. Lord, we pray for healing for those who need it. Um, continue to be with Lorena, bring her back to us again soon, uh, and bless the many people on our hearts and minds that uh, need healing in some form or another. Give us the strength that we need for our daily lives, but also to be that witness that you've called all, us, all of us to be. Lord, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to dive into your word, and we pray that as we do so, you will speak to us just what we as individuals need to hear today. And so it's for that that we lift all these things up to you, not in our name, but in the name of Jesus. Well, last week we ended our sermon and our study through the book of Acts, chapter 8, with a challenge to pray this last week for divine appointments to be a witness. Did anybody take me up on the challenge? This is accountability moment here. I know at least one of you did because someone this week said to me, John, because of what you said, because of what we saw in the book of Acts, while they were at work, they had an opportunity uh, they simply wrote on their name tag, below their name and so forth, how can I pray for you today? And one of her coworkers, who's not Christian, said to her, hey, could you pray for me for peace? Uh, and so for the very first time, one of Parkwood church members was able to pray with their non-Christian coworker simply because they did something intentional for God. If you want experiences witnessing, if you want to be a witness, not only pray, but also do things intentionally. All right, well, today, uh, I don't usually tell these kinds of stories, but uh, nevertheless, here we go. In a small town here in the Central Valley, one of my friends, who's a pastor in the Adventist Church, grew up. And he told me the story about his friend and another associate of his. This was uh, several years ago. They were out rollerblading. And he said to me, now this was the, the cool kind of rollerblading, not the, the other kind. So they were like grinding on rails and trying to jump over staircases and uh, the kind that we don't want in our parking lot, but kind of looks cool when people can do it properly. So his friends were doing that. And they were about 18 or 20 or so, um, old enough to be on their own, doing their own thing. That evening, uh, they're lounging in the cul-de-sac um, in front of their home, and then the guy lived a little bit um, not far away in the same neighborhood. They're sitting there on the sidewalk and just relaxing after a fun afternoon of skating, and they see something strange in the sky. He looks up, both of them, and they see this light in the sky. Not a normal light, a different sort of light, a bright light. And as they're watching this light, something happens. They don't know what happens. But the next thing that both of, they, both of them knew, 
they woke up in their individual homes the next morning in their own beds with no memory of what had happened the night before. So they call each other, hey, do you remember what happened yesterday? We were seeing that light in the sky and then something weird happened and, and then I don't remember anything and, and here I am in my house. And they compare notes and they both had identical scars on their leg that they didn't have before they saw the light. Now you can see why I don't tell these sorts of stories. I don't think they were abducted by aliens, okay? Uh, I, I think that there are some good explanations for what happened, but nevertheless, the point remains, when they saw the light, their lives were never the same after that moment. You can ask me later what I think might have happened. But they saw the light, and something changed in their own heart, in their own life. Something wasn't the same. Today, as we get into Acts chapter 9, I want to look at somebody else who saw the light. A much better light, a much brighter light, a much more glorious light. And after he saw the light, his life was definitely not the same. Many of you know who we're talking about. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Acts chapter 9. We've been introduced to this fellow already. Currently in the book of Acts, he goes by Saul. Later on, we're going to find out he's going to be given a new name. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, uh, we saw the havoc that he was uh, creating in the early Christian church. We don't know how much time passed, but now Saul is still doing it breathing out these threats of murder, and he goes to the high priest, verse 2, and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of where? Ooh, that was, that was pretty silent. Uh, so there's a city in verse 2 of Acts chapter 9, and what's the city? Damascus. Damascus, yeah. And it's hard if we're in different translations of the Bible. I'm reading from the New King James, but you can read from whatever you want to today. So he asked for letters. Now, previously, when we saw him with the stoning of Stephen, what was he doing at the stoning of Stephen? He was just holding the coats. He was the coat boy. And now, he has become elevated and uh, even, we're told, invited into the Sanhedrin. Uh, and now he is asking for letters, authority, permission to go to Damascus, and there were maybe 30 or 40 synagogues in Damascus at this time, because he's going to root out and find the Christians, and he's going to take them to be arrested and whatever may happen else after there. So he's asking for these letters for the city of Damascus. Damascus has a lot of history. Uh, tradition says that that's the spot where Abel was killed, the first person to be killed in the Bible. Uh, many stories could be told from Damascus. But it says there, so if he found any who were of the way... That was the first name given to Christianity, the way. Remember, Jesus himself said, I am the way. Uh, I'm the path. And so people who were following in the path of Jesus, following after Jesus, they just were called the way or the path, which is a pretty cool name. He wanted to find people who were part of the way, whether men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. It's about a 150-mile journey from Jerusalem to Damascus. He's almost done. He's perhaps been on the road for six days. And there's no evidence that he was on a horseback, uh, as sometimes it's depicted. He probably did most or all of it on foot. It says, suddenly, a light shone around him from where? From heaven. And this word for light is the same word that's used in other places when Jesus talks about flashes of lightning. This is not some puny little light. This is a bright light, a blinding light. And later on in Acts, Paul will tell us, Saul will tell us, that this light was brighter than the sun. And if you've ever looked at the sun, even though we shouldn't because it's bad for our eyes, you know how bright that is. This was way brighter. It fell around him from heaven. Verse 4, Then he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His name is repeated. Can you think of any other Bible characters that had their name called twice to them? Moses, good one, Anita. Martha, good one. Samuel, exactly. Peter, yes, exactly. Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me twice. Uh, there's, I think, one or two more of them, but you guys did fabulous. Uh, when your name is called twice by God, it gets your attention. Extra. It's extra important. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we'll find out that this voice is the voice of Jesus. Now, here's a question. Who physically was Paul arresting and putting in prison? People of the way. Was he physically arresting Jesus and putting Jesus in prison? No. But when Jesus sees his people suffering, he feels the pain too. And so he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Brothers and sisters sitting here today, those of you watching from home, you may be feeling pain. You may be suffering today. But know that Jesus not only sees your pain, he feels it too. What does it say in Isaiah 53? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We have a God, a Savior, who identifies and experiences our suffering. And he suffered so that we wouldn't have to suffer further. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now up to this point, Saul had been very zealous for God. He'd been doing these things because he thought they were the right thing to do. He was very zealous. He was fanatical for his faith, but he thought he was doing the right thing. And this is a good reminder to us, so we have to be very careful that we make sure we're actually doing the Lord's will. Could it be sometimes we, like Saul, we think we're doing what's right and we're actually causing harm to God's church? We don't have to look very far in the news, in the media, to find Christians who are thinking they are standing up for God and they're turning people away from God. They're misrepresenting the character of God. And it, if we're honest, we all have done that. So we have to be very careful. But Saul thought he was doing the right thing, and then he meets Jesus, this bright light. He sees the light, and in verse 5 he says, Who are you, Lord? This is probably capital or lowercase l. He doesn't yet know that this is, is Jesus. And it says, next, however, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Again, Jesus is feeling the pain and suffering of his children. The next um, couple sentences are not in the original Greek. If you're reading from the King James or New King James, you'll find them there. They're, they're actually found in Paul's later retellings of this story, but we'll read them here. Erasmus, when he was going from Latin and creating his own Greek um, version, he added them for whatever reason. Um, but nevertheless, they were things that Paul said. Uh, it says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You've been resisting the Holy Spirit, Paul, Saul. It's hard. Why are you doing that? So he, trembling, verse 6, and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Get up. Go into the city. Now, was, was Saul alone on his journey there? I mean, Jesus had, had been there, uh, but who else was with him? There were some men who were traveling with him. Verse 7, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Saul not only had, was given authority to go in and round up people, he was given people to go help do the arresting and the rounding up. And they heard something, but they didn't understand it. They saw something, but they didn't fully see it. 
Verse 8, And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and either, neither ate nor drank. What would you be thinking and feeling if you were Saul in that moment? Three long days, totally blind, you just had this experience where you saw the light and you spoke with Jesus. What would you be thinking? What would you be feeling? Would you feel guilt and regret over what you'd been doing, persecuting people who were actually following the Jesus that you now had met? Would you be amazed and astonished and overwhelmed? Like, how did I miss it? How, how, did, I, how did I get to this point? He had three long days to think about it, didn't eat, spent a lot of time thinking, a lot of time praying. Verse 10, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named, named what? Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight. Interestingly enough, in Damascus today, there still is a street uh, that goes from east to west, uh, and about 20 or 30 feet below the modern street is the ancient street, probably the one that Paul traveled on, that Saul traveled on. Uh, and it's called the Straight. Can you guess why? It's a long, straight street. <laughs> Recently, I was rock climbing up at a place called Lover's Leap, and there's beautiful cliffs and all sorts of amazing climbs there. And as I was walking up there for the first time, my buddy said, can you guess which climb is called the line? And as I looked up at these massive cliffs, you know, 300 plus foot tall, I could see one climb that was just straight up and down. Uh, usually climbs, they, they wander and meander, but this one was just straight. And that's how the street was, just right through town. And that's where Saul was. Go to the street called Straight, Inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. He did a lot of praying during that time. Go find this guy. And in a vision he has seen, which is interesting, Paul was blind, but he still could see in vision. He has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. Paul's reputation as a persecutor had spread. Here, 150 miles from Jerusalem, in Damascus, people knew about Saul. They didn't have cable news, they didn't have email, they didn't have texting, but people knew there was a persecutor of Christians, and Ananias knew. And how would you feel if God is telling you to go to this chief inquisitor chief persecutor and try and help him out. Would you be a little bit hesitant at all? Yeah, sure. Sure, he had an experience. This is just a big trick. It's a big setup. He's going to get us all in one place, and then he's going to arrest us all. And Maybe that's why God gave Ananias a vision, so that he knew this is what he was supposed to be doing. And God gave Saul a vision, too. So he'd heard about this man. He'd heard how much harm he had done for the saints in Jerusalem. Verse 14, And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. God said, Nope, this guy, I've chosen him for a special purpose. Verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said to him, what? What did he call him? Brother Saul. Now, is that what you would typically call someone who had been your enemy? Hey, brother, how's it going? That was grace working in and through Ananias' heart. He knew that this was God's will, and wouldn't those have been comforting words to hear? Because you can imagine how, 
how Saul must have been beating himself up. And you can read later on in his writings how he felt so badly for the people that he had arrested and some had been murdered through his influence. He couldn't take that back, but now somebody is coming to him and calling him brother. That indicates he's accepting him. He's welcoming him. You too, Saul, are a part of this family. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales or flakes, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Can you imagine the turnaround here? He's going to Damascus to go help people get arrested and perhaps murdered. And then he sees the light and everything changes. And now he's being baptized in the name of Jesus, who was his arch enemy, the one he'd, he wanted to persecute the followers of Jesus. Verse 19, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Verse 20, immediately... What did he do? He preached the Christ. Where? In the synagogues. That he is the Son of God. And then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem? And has come here that he, for that purpose, that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? Don't miss the irony here. He was given letters, giving him permission to go into all the 30 or 40 synagogues in Damascus, and root out and find anyone who was a part of the way so they could be bound and taken back to Jerusalem to await their fate, whatever it might be. And now, something happens. He sees the light, and a few days later, he's going into the synagogues, not with those letters, but with a story to tell, a person to talk about named Jesus, and he's there for peace, and not for persecution. Isn't this amazing? I mean, what an irony. What a, what a, talk about a U-turn. He was going one way, immediately turned and went the other way, which is really testimony to his sincerity of faith. He, he really thought he was doing the Lord's will before, and when he saw how wrong he had been, he changed his life immediately. Many of us sense God calling us, sense God leading us, and we say, uh, I'm not so sure about that, God. Eh, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, some other time. Talk to me about that, God, next year, and then, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of see how it goes. Saul, nope, realized, whoa, my whole life recently has been an error. Immediately he makes a change. And immediately he springs into action, telling other people how good Jesus was and is. Verse 24, 22. <coughs> but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus was the Christ. He starts stirring up things in Damascus. Instead of for bad, he's stirring it up for good. Verse 23 says, now after many days were passed, probably between verse 22 and verse 23, there are three years. In Galatians, Paul tells about his, and if, I'm saying Paul a lot because his name gets changed to Paul. If you didn't know, uh, that's, that's why. He spends three years in Arabia, or at least three years generally in that area. So many time, many days passed, verse 23, the Jews were plotting to kill him. He's back in Damascus again, and, and the, the people say, we can't have this guy doing what he's doing. But when their plot became known to Saul, they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Verse 25, and the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in what? A large basket. Now, don't miss, again, the irony here. Who was it that let him down through the wall? The disciples, the other Christian believers in that area, the people he was coming to arrest. 
are helping him to escape. Later on, we find out that he goes out through a window in the wall in a large basket. Now, Paul wasn't a very big guy, but this was a large basket for this uh, to, to happen, probably one made of, of like rope. So he goes out through the wall, escaping for his life. Verse 26, and when Saul had come to what city? Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But what was their response, at least those who were there? They were afraid of him. And, and, and I can't say that I blame them. Would you be afraid if this guy, you, you hadn't really seen him, but you'd heard what he had done, and, and now he's trying to, you might be thinking, he's trying to figure out where, how we work, how we operate, he's going undercover, and then he's going to spring on us, and we'll all be arrested. So they were hesitant. They didn't believe he was a disciple. But then verse 27, but Barnabas. Barnabas elsewhere has been translated as the son of encouragement. This guy named Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, how he had spoken to him, and how he would preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. Had it not been for Barnabas, we don't know what would have happened in his relationship to the other apostles, but Barnabas, seeing that Saul was an outsider, seeing that they were rejecting him, they said, he said, no, listen guys, I can vouch for him. I've seen him. He's one of us. Have you ever felt like an outsider before? It happens to us in all sorts of settings. Isn't it nice when there's a Barnabas to bring you into the circle to make you feel welcome? Are you going to be a Barnabas for someone? God needs more Barnabases, Barnabies, maybe that's the plural, in this world. Verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to do what to him? To kill him. The Hellenists were the, the Greek uh, origin or the Greek cultured Jews. They, they attempted to kill him. But when they, the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea, to the seaport, and sent him out to Tarsus, back to his hometown for a while as things cooled down. Last verse. Then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria had what? Peace. And they were edified. That means they were built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. What an amazing story. Somebody who was a sworn enemy of Jesus and his followers now becomes great evangelist, persuading others to become followers. We're going to follow his story uh, later on through the book of Acts. But as we wrap up today, I want to ask, what can we learn from this story? And maybe the Holy Spirit has a totally different lesson for you, but I, I thought of three major things that we can learn from the story of Saul. Number one, nobody is a hopeless case. God can work and change anybody's life if they're willing. So don't stop praying for people in your life. The, that, those family members that are just so rebellious, those family members who swore off God, who don't believe in God, don't stop praying for them. Their case is not hopeless. Amen? Don't stop working and, and you know, co uh, cooperating with the Holy Spirit to be a blessing in their life. Those co-workers, those neighbors, their case is not hopeless. If anybody was hopeless, it was Saul. And God changed his life, and he can change others as well. People can change, number one. Number two, God needs people like Ananias and Barnabas to help mentor and encourage and love others the way they did. We don't know how different the story of Saul might have been had Ananias said, nope, I know him, I've heard of him, I'm not doing it, God. 
or if Barnabas had left Saul on the outside of the circle. But because they stepped up, the story is a beautiful one. Who's in your life? Who's in this church? Who's in your neighborhood? Who's in your family that needs a Barnabas or an Ananias? Needs that encouragement and welcoming attitude? Needs uh, mentoring from you? Who can you encourage today? Uh, super simple, even like a potluck. Hey, who's sitting at a table by themselves that I can invite to come sit at my table? Or maybe I'll go move and sit at their table. Really practical things we can be doing. So number one, people can change. No case is hopeless. Number two, God needs people to be a part of his encouraging, mentoring, discipling team. And point number three, lesson number three, when you encounter the light, your life will be changed. Now, I've never seen the light like Saul did, and I'm guessing I never will. But this book right here says it's a lamp to our feet, and what to our path? A light to our path. Jesus himself is the light. And if we spend time day by day in this book, it's going to change us, if we're willing. And it's going to help us to work for people and pray for people who are lost. And it's going to help us to love and support people who need that in our lives. This week, this day, this year. So I want to see the light, how about you? And I want to let the light change me for good. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful you didn't give up on Saul. Lord, you haven't given up on us either, or our family, or our friends. Use us, Father, to make a difference, to be an encourager, to be a witness, to be a blessing. And day by day, help us to seek you out, to let you change us, so that we can become more like you. And as we are filled with your light, Lord, shine your light out of us, so that others can see how good you are. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, let all God's disciples say, Amen and Amen.